Every now and then, I hear someone talking about God, and right now I'm talking about people who say that there's no God. I'll hear people who say that there's no God talking about God, and the impression that I get when I hear the person talk is that they think they're smarter than God. That's the impression that I get listening to them. They seem to think that because they've come up with some thought or some saying that sounds maybe kind of clever, uh, and they're saying this on a talk show or a podcast, they, they think they've got something on God, it, it appears to me, the way they're talking. Like, um, I, I've heard people who claim to be atheists ask this type of question. I heard somebody, a couple years ago, I saw a clip of, of a man um, who's kind of a celebrity in England, and he's well known for being an atheist. And the person who was talking to him on this show said, hey, what happens if when you die, you find out, oh, oh there is a God after all. And now here you are standing before this God that you've denied. What are you going to do with that? And I've heard people give this kind of an answer. I heard this guy say this, and I've heard other people say things along this line, these lines too. The person said, oh yeah, what'll I say? Here's what I'll say. I'll ask God, hey, why did you do this? Or why did you do that, God? Or hey, God, what's the deal here? Why all this pain and suffering in the world? Huh, God? Answer me that, God. You've probably heard this kind of thing too. When I've heard people say things along these lines, and again, I just I saw this clip a couple of years ago. I think to myself, "You're kidding, right? You, you, you actually you, like you, you know you say you don't believe in God, but you think if you're if you are standing before God someday, you're going to have him stymied and flustered with your questions. You think that's how this is going to go? Like you're going to put God on the defensive? Do you?" And this is a guy who's known for his intellect. Are you serious? You think that's going to happen? You're, you're going to be the one, you're going to stand before God someday and you're going to call God to account? What? And again, I, I bring this up because it just feels like there's a sense in which anybody who would say something like this, they must think, I'm a little more clever than God is. They're going to have God on the ropes. I hear this, I have an urge when I hear this kind of thing. I, I, I want to grab the person by the shoulders and say, you're not smarter than God. You might think you've come up with some really sharp, savvy, ingenious little thing, but you have a surprise coming your way. And if you keep going down this road, it's, really, it's not going to be a pleasant surprise. And this is the phrase that came to my mind. You know, you're not smarter than God. By the way, I've discovered if you shake someone and tell them they're not smarter than God, it's not very effective. That, that, that doesn't, uh, uh, I've had the cops called on me a couple times now. Uh, so, with this in mind, like towards the beginning of this year, a bunch of months ago, this was playing on my mind. Again, I'd seen several things, people saying things about God. And this idea came, I felt like God was leading me to, to address this. And so we're going to start a brief series today. It's a five-week series. And the title of the series is, You're Not Smarter Than God. And uh, I've been doing books of the Bible. We're going to go back to doing books of the Bible again. We're going to do First and Second Thessalonians after this. But I want to take this five-week series and we're going to look at some of these things that people say or do that sort of seems to give an indication that they think they're smarter than God. And we're going to apply some biblical thinking, biblical truth, and biblical wisdom to this matter. So to begin the series today, we're going to look at this idea that some people have that they just reject God. They say there is no God. They deny God. And apparently they think, I can just avoid the whole issue of God by denying Him. By denying that He even exists. So... Let's do this. Uh, take the Bible that's near you there, if you will, please. And we're going to turn to Psalm chapter 14, verse 1. If a person were to say, I have come to the realization that there just is no God, I would want them to encounter verses like this one. Psalm chapter 14, verse 1. I would want them to think about this and wrestle with what is being told to us here in the book of Psalms. So if you're using a pew Bible, we have two different fonts, so it'll be on one of those two pages. 
Psalm chapter 14, and we're going to read verse 1. Probably a lot of you have heard this before, I suspect. If you haven't, say yes. yes. Watch this. Only what? Fools. Only fools say in their hearts, there is no God. They are corrupt. Their actions are evil. Not one of them does good. Only a fool says there is no God. Only a fool would say something like that. Now, in light of that verse and what it says, I feel like a great question would be, why? Why is that? Only a fool would deny that there's a God. Why? Why would that person be foolish? I got a couple answers to that. The first one is this. If a person denies God, that person is denying a truth that actually, in their heart of hearts, they know to be a real and valid truth. They know that God is real. So if they're denying God, they're denying reality. You say, Dan, are you suggesting that people who, all these people who claim to be atheists, actually, when the rubber meets the road, they actually do believe in God? And my answer is, yeah. Yeah, I do believe that. I believe that's the case. I do. Now, don't get me wrong. If a person maintains a lie vigorously enough and long enough, they can get to a point where, in a certain sense, they come to believe their own lie. I understand how that kind of a reality can work. I get it. But the fundamental truth is that people, in their heart of hearts, they know that there's a God. So, this is one of the reasons that I think it's foolish to say that there's no God. If you're saying something, if you're holding to some position that really you know is true, that's, or that, that you know is not true, that's foolish. There's a passage of scripture, uh, scripture in Romans chapter 1. Many of you know this. We talk about this. We've looked at this passage a number of times because it's such, a, it's such an interesting and weighty uh, passage of scripture. And um, this passage helps us understand that actually people do know that there's a God. This, this passage of scripture helps us see that. So I'm going to invite you to turn there. They may maintain their denial. Romans chapter 1, we're going to read verses 18 through 20. They may deny that there's a God, but in their heart of hearts, actually they know that that's not true. Romans chapter 1, I'm going to start at verse 18. This helps us see what's going on here in some ways when people say that there's no God. Romans chapter 1, verse 18. You have it say yes. Yes. But God shows his anger from heaven against all sinful, wicked people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Now look at this, verse 19. They know the truth about God because he has made it obvious to them. Stop for a minute. Do people know that there's a God? Yeah, they know. As a matter of fact, according, that's not what I say, that's what God says. It's obvious to them. They know. How is it obvious to them? Well, let's keep reading. Verse 20. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his uh, eternal power, and divine nature. So the way that they would say this in the theological world is, God has revealed himself. How do you know there's a God? Because he's revealed himself. How? Look around. Where did it all come from? Well, some atoms, should, well, where did the atoms come from? Well, there was a bang. Where did the bang come from? People know. God has revealed himself. He goes on. One more sentence here. So they have no, look at the wording here. They have no excuse for not knowing God. There's no excuse. See, nobody's going to be able to stand before God someday and say, you didn't make it clear to me. It wasn't clear enough to me that you exist. You were hidden. No, he made it clear. You say, well, Dan, we believe it's clear to us, but it was not clear to them. Yes, it was. How do you know? You don't know another person's heart. You don't know another person's mind, Dan. You're absolutely right. I do not know. I'm telling you this because this is what it says in the Bible. See, God does know. I don't know. Who does? God knows. We just read, God tells us. He made it clear to them. That was verse 19, we just read it. They know the truth about God because he's made it obvious to them. 
See, God tells us that he has revealed himself in, in a way that's obvious to them. They know. See, you can know. One, a, a theologian that I really like says, if you're willing. If you're not willing, then you, you don't have to go down that road. But if you're willing to see, you can see. A great question would be, are you willing? Are you willing? So again, if somebody knows that there's a God, deep in their hearts they know. They may deny and they may argue and they may mock God. Maybe they don't want there to be a God, but they know. And if they know, but they're continuing to deny God, that's foolish. That's foolish. Let me give you a second one. Why would a person be a fool if they deny God? Here's the second answer. We go back again to Romans chapter 1. If you continue reading past the section that we just read just a moment ago, there are more verses that talk about these people who won't acknowledge God. In verse 21, it says about these folks who, who deny God and don't acknowledge God. It says, yeah, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship him as God or even give him thanks. They knew, but they wouldn't worship him. If you go on to verse 25, go a little bit further, it says about these folks who deny God, catch the language here. They traded the truth about God for a lie. And so what happens, this is in the Bible verse, so they worshiped and served the things God created instead of the creator himself. So you see what happens? They end up worshiping. They worship, but they don't worship God. See, here's a very interesting reality. Listen to this. Human beings are going to worship something. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You are. I, we are. We're, we're created in such a way that something is going to capture us. And we will, in some sense, we will give to that thing, whatever it is, something that we would identify as worship or devotion. In Romans chapter 1, we're told that these people will not recognize God, and, uh, but it says this in, verses, uh, in verse 23. It says, instead of worshiping the glorious, ever-living God, they worshiped idols made to look like mere people, birds, animals, and reptiles. The point I'm getting at is people are going to worship something. Everybody, you, you worship something, so do I. Frankly, in our culture, there are many people who seem like they're just not religious in any way. They're irreligious. They're worshiping something. In many cases, in our culture, you know who they're worshiping, don't you? <laughs> Me. They're worshiping themselves. See, we're going to put something up high. We're going to worship something. Maybe it's a job. Maybe it's money. Maybe it's the pursuit of power. But we're going to worship something. So if we deny God, the real true God, then think about it. Whatever we worship is lesser. And that's why it's foolish. You're worshiping a lesser thing if you deny God. In light of God's existence, it's foolish since there is a God, it's foolish to worship anything that's lesser than God. Why would you worship something lesser than God when there's a God that exists? That's foolish. If you deny God and you worship the accumulation of power, you're worshiping something that looks good, I know, but it's lesser. It's lesser than God. If you worship money and things and all the material things that money can get you, you're worshiping something that's lesser than God. You see this, right? It's lesser than God. Of course it is. If you worship yourself, you're worshiping something lesser than God. Here's a great question for all of us. Who do you worship? What do you worship? You worship something. Don't tell me I don't worship anything, Dan. Yeah, you do. So why is it foolish to deny God? Answer, because you're going to end up worshiping something. It's just part of what humans do. And therefore, if you're not worshiping God, it's going to be something lesser than God. What a foolish thing to do. You doing all right? One more thing. God laid this on my heart this week. I, you know, I'm reading, I'm studying, I'm praying, I'm thinking about all this. And, and 
God kind of lays this on my mind. Every single person, everyone, 100%, everyone who's ever lived, not just in this room, every person who's ever lived, everyone is born and we come into this world and we begin a process. You, I, you know, you could put it this way. We, you're born and you begin a journey. It's a journey of learning and growing and observing what's going on around you and experiencing things. Some of it is good, some of it's bad, but you just continue on. The journey continues, and all along the way as this journey is happening, it's just unfolding for us right now, we're, we're developing, we're attempting to understand, and big, a large part of it is what we're trying to figure out is, what is this all about? What's it all about? We're born into different homes, different environments, different countries, different cultures. We experience all kinds of different circumstances. Everybody's situations are different. And, and everything that happens, though, for all of us, it's shaping us. Every experience, everything that happens, it's influencing us. All the relationships that we've ever had from the, from the very beginning with our mom all the way up until today, every relationship has had some kind of, of an effect on us. Some of them very small, many of them very small and minor. Some of these relationships have affected us in very, very significant ways, and we just continue. We're on this journey called life, and we're taking it in, and we're attempting to figure it all out. And one aspect of wisdom as we're going through this journey, it's not the only aspect, but one aspect of wisdom is coming to a place in the course of this journey in which we begin to have at least a pretty good understanding of this. What's really important? What's really important in all of this? All kinds of things are vying for our attention, are vying for our allegiance. All kinds of things are happening. Okay, among all of this stuff, what's important? Your life is happening. My life is happening. The clock continues to tick, whether we want it to or not. You say, Dan, can we just pause that clock for a moment? i got to slow it down and figure some things out. No. No. The clock doesn't stop for anyone, does it? It just keeps ticking. There it goes. It's still ticking right now. Right now. i got to get some Taco Bell soon. And it's ticking. It's ticking. We can't pause it. We're getting older. However much time you have right now, it's decreasing every moment yes yeah again a big part of wisdom do you want to be wise say yes yes i do Dan. not the only part but a big part of wisdom is discovering this then okay i didn't ask for this i didn't ask to be born but here i am that'll never change now i exist so why do i exist what's really important hey have you figured that out yet the clock's ticking Probably better get on this. Better figure it out. When we say that it's foolish to deny God, part of the reason for that is this. He's what's most important. So think of it like this. You have a lifetime. Some of us have a short one, some of us have a real long one, but you got a lifetime to figure out what's important. The answer is God is most important. And if you go through your life and you don't come to see that, you don't come to grips with that, if you're unwilling to see that and acknowledge what is most important, <coughs> that would be very foolish. It'd be a very foolish journey through life to go through the whole thing and not figure out that he's what's most important. The Apostle Paul said at one time, this is in the Bible, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. It would be foolish to ignore or deny God. Jesus said one time, what do you benefit if you gain the whole world, but you lose your soul? It would be foolish to ignore or deny God and lose your soul. Paul wrote this, this is in Colossians chapter one. What's most important? This helps us answer this. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is, listen to the words, and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see. He made the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, authorities in the unseen world. Everything, this is what the text says, everything was created through him, through Christ, and for him. Everything was created through him 
And for who? Yes. For him. It's created for him. And then in verse 17 it says, He existed before anything else and he holds all of it together. He holds all creation together. Who could be more, who could possibly be more important than that? Who could, no one. No one could be more important. You want to know what life is all about? You want to know what's important? You want to know why you exist? It's about Jesus. Your life is about Jesus. He made you. You only exist because of him. Your existence is about him. So, again, it would be foolish to go through a whole lifetime and not come to grips with that truth and that reality. Fools ignore God and deny God. And part of why that's foolish is because they live their lives, they go through this whole journey, and they do not come to a point where they acknowledge this critical, this eternity-altering truth. They go through all of life, and they won't come to grips with, he's what this is all about. Have you come to grips with that? I hope so. I hope so. Let me pray. Let me pray. Lord Jesus, in this moment, move and work in this room. Probably just about everyone, maybe everybody here is a believer. I hope that's the case. I don't know everybody's heart, but stir in us a fire for you, Lord. Stir in us a fire to, to share the truth of who you are with the people that we love in good ways, in helpful ways. Not shaking them the way I suggested earlier, but speaking in love and grace and truth. We want to be we want to be your ambassadors in this world, Lord Jesus. Holy Spirit, move. Pray that this would happen in Jesus name. Amen.